Good evening, delegates. Give another round of applause for the leadership that the NAACP develops and Taj Brown, formerly from Region 2, now from Region 5. Taj Brown, a former youth board member of the National Board of Directors of the NAACP. My friends, I, I'm grateful to be here tonight, and I'm also humbled. I want to especially say thank you to the members of the National Board of Directors of the NAACP, because without them, I would not be here. And so I want you to see them. With the members of the National Board of Directors of the NAACP, please stand. I thank you all for the trust that you have given to me. And to members of our Special Contribution Fund Board of Trustees, I'd like you to stand as well because you keep the doors open by contributing resources year after year to our great association. Members of the Special Contribution Fund Board of Directors, led by its chairman, Eugene Duffy, please stand. Let's give it up. These individuals are our corporate partners, and we are so grateful to all of them. I'm hum humbled to lead this organization with a dynamic young man who together we are leading and shepherding the transformation of a new generation of social justice advocates. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a team and we are working together to make sure that the nation's oldest, baddest, and boldest civil rights organization remains relevant for the challenges that lie ahead. Please join me in saying thank you to our leader, the Honorable Benjamin Todd Jealous. Now, we don't do this work alone, and there are members of the staff who are here. You saw those who are members of our development department, and I'm sure our president and CEO will acknowledge them appropriately tomorrow. But we, on behalf of the board, also want to say thank you to the hardest working folks in civil rights, the staff of the NAACP. Would you please stand and acknowledge them? To two individuals on whose shoulders I stand, I say thank you to a beautiful woman who is stately, who's quiet, and is courageous. She's my hero, the Honorable Chairman Emeritus of this great association, the Honorable Merle Evers Williams. You can do better than that. NAACP, you can do better than that. You can do better than that and you can do better than that. What we learn in the NAACP is you always remember to say thank you. And so I also have to say thank you to a gentleman who helped tutor me, a gentleman who helped me as a diplomat to temper my temper. But when he walks in a room, you know that a force of nature has entered. He's distinguished, he's affable. He is one in whom we are so proud, the Honorable Julian Bond. You can do better than that. We have history in the room tonight. We have history in the room tonight and we stand on their shoulders. I wouldn't be here if it were not for my parents who are in the room and my family who have joined me here on the front row. And I want to say thank you, Mama, for always being here for me. And to my brother who is here, I'm grateful to you as well 
for always having my back. I thank you to those who are standing in the back, to BB, those who work in the chairman's office, Nicholas Wiggins. You are the wind beneath my wings. And I'm so grateful for my family who traveled more than six hours on the other end of the state to be with me as well. And those who live in this city, I thank you for being here. I love you so very, very much. But friends, lest I hold you too long, you know that I'm a, the great granddaughter of a Baptist preacher. But unlike most Baptist preachers, I don't believe I have to keep you long to leave something with you. And so I hope that every now and then I will hear from you. And so I'll cut across the field and get to where we want to be. Is that all right? So in AACP, I'm glad to be home in the state of my birth. I'm so grateful to my soror, <clears throat> the AKA Adora Obinueze, president of the Florida State Conference of NAACP branches for her leadership. I'm grateful to President Marta Lee as well. But my friends, we're gathered here tonight because the NAACP has a rich history. We have a legacy of liberation. We are a people of progress. For more than 100 years, our leaders have given their creativity. Members have given their energy. Supporters have given their resources. And yes, martyrs have made the ultimate sacrifice by giving their lives to fulfill our mission to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate racial hatred and racial discrimination. But we could not come to Orlando, Florida and fail to recognize civil rights activists Harry T. Moore and Harriet Moore. These civil rights leaders deserve far more attention and honor than they have been afforded in the history books. Both of them were educators, and they were advocates for equal pay for African-American teachers across this state. And together, they worked to register 116,000 black voters in Florida. The record is still held by President Adora with 100, more than 123,000 registered voters in Florida last year. Let's give her a big round of applause. But my friends, Harry was killed on Christmas Day, 1951, when a bomb placed beneath the couple's Mims, Florida home exploded. His wife, Harriet, died from her injuries nine days later. Federal investigators suspected that the Ku Klux Klan was behind the bombing, but to date, no one has been charged. Harry T. Moore was the first NAACP official killed during the civil rights struggle. And the couple was the only husband and wife to give their lives to this movement. I encourage you to learn more about this important chapter in our civil rights history through a PBS documentary called Freedom Never Dies. When commenting on his voter mobilization efforts in Florida, Harry Moore said, freedom never descends upon a people. It is always bought with a price. And so for more than a century, my friends, we have been at the vanguard of working for equality in a nation where too many powers resist freedom and justice for all people. Our rich history, however, has not been in a straight line. Like the tides of the ocean, we have witnessed ebbs and flows. We have known ups and we have known downs. We have encountered successes 
and setbacks. We've crossed mountains and walked through some dark valleys. But yet, we continue this fight for justice because we agree with the oft-quoted inscription on the King Memorial in the nation's capital that was inscribed by the 19th century abolitionist Theodore Parker who said, quote, we shall overcome because the arc of the more universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Chairman Bond, we all want to believe that, but we all have to remember who bends the universe towards justice. Even those of us who believe in a providential God know, as President Kennedy said in the last line of his famous inaugural address, that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. And so we're here. We're here. Standing at the crossroads of freedom and equality, at the 104th Annual Convention of the NAACP, proclaiming that when it comes to the cause of justice, that we shall not be moved. <laughs> These words of resistance, defiance, and survival are grounded in the African-American spiritual, I shall not be moved, whose roots stretch back to the days of our enslavement. But sadly, my friends, the idea of standing our ground has taken on a perverse meaning in the wake of the murder of Trayvon Benjamin Martin 18 months ago, and the acquittal yesterday of his murderer last night, just 30 miles from here in Sanford, Florida. Tonight we stand in solidarity with the Martin family who are calling for peace and who are saying that the only way to honor and to allow Trayvon to rest in peace is that we are peaceful. But you know, in AACP, we've been here before. 58 years ago, Madam Murley, a child in Mississippi went to the store just to buy some candy. And on that trip, it led to his murder. And on last year, 57 years after that date, a child in Sanford, Florida, went to the store to buy some candy, and that led to his murder. Two black boys who had trust and faith in America. Two black boys who were yet grasping for the pursuit of happiness that had been promised. Two innocent black boys, Reverend Amos Brown, just going to the store to buy candy. How many times must young black men in this country have to walk through a community under the threat of suspicion? How many times must our young black men be profiled just walking while black? How many times? How many mothers have to send their children into a world with a hope that is tempered with fear, knowing that in this nation, Christine, in 2013, somebody in a neighborhood can treat your son 
as if he is a potential threat and not the loving son you raised him to be. How long, NAACP, must we wait? In the wee hours of this morning, I sat with young people representing NAACP units across this nation who channeled their hurt and frustration into a decisive call to action to stop the violence. <laughs> to stop the violence, Reverend Deere, whether it be in a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago or a gated community in Sanford, Florida, whether the perpetrator looks like us or not, NAACP, we must end gun violence in America. <laughs> Throughout our history, in stark contrast to those who promote and use lethal force, We've always stood our ground through nonviolent civil disobedience, Chairman Bond, and peaceful resistance to discrimination and injustice. When we were threatened, we sang, before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. When placed under arrest for civil disobedience, we answered that call with keep your eyes on the prize and hold on. And when our hearts were heavy with grief, we eased our pain with a mantra, we'll never turn back, no never. And we are resolved at this hour to stand our ground with a reply that we shall not be moved. But our history of refusing to be moved did not end with the storied days of the Civil Rights Movement. Just last year, amidst the most concerted efforts by the forces of regression to keep us away from the polls, we turned out in greater numbers than ever before. Michael, we voted in massive numbers. Despite pernicious new requirements and outrageously long lines that would have discouraged less determined people. They don't know who we are. They don't know where we come from. Don't know what we're made of. But lest we not forget Dessaline Victor of North Miami, a naturalized citizen from Haiti, who at 102 years old stood in line for more than three hours to cast her vote in the last presidential election. Our young people can take something from her example because she said that even if I got dizzy and collapsed in this line, this is something I have to do. Dessaline Victor would not be moved. The forces arrayed against us are dizzying, but let us pause to reflect on how far we've come and how these events, Dr. Goatley, speak to us today. Think about this, my friends. The landmark anniversaries that we observe this year shine like stars in the heavens. They are the 150th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, the 104th anniversary of the founding of the NAACP, the 100th anniversary of Greek letter sorority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, who are celebrating their centennial this year. 
in Washington, D.C. I tip my hats to the lady in red and white, but I'm a pink and green lady myself. <laughs> the 100th anniversary of the death of abolitionist Harriet Tubman. The 100th anniversary of the birth of civil rights heroine, heroine Rosa Parks. The 50th anniversary of the assassination of our beloved NAACP Field Secretary, Megga Wiley Evans. The 50th anniversary of the desegregation of the University of Alabama by Vivian Malone and James Hood. The 50th anniversary of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And the 50th anniversary of the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. But something that we are most proud of as a community of color. 2013 was the second anniversary of the inauguration of the first African American president of the United States of America, President Barack Hussein Obama. Y'all ought to be shouting. We helped deliver that vote. But these landmarks in the history of our liberation allow us to build on them and to take our movement, Siobhan, to the next level as we address the critical work, Sammy, that lies ahead. Like Fannie Lou Hamer, Mama Dukes, we sick and tired of being sick and tired. But we will never get sick of protesting the continuing inequities that our people face. We will never tire of working diligently to make this a more fair and just society for all Americans. But if you think about it, the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation did not bring us full liberation to enslaved people. It contributed, yes, to the long road toward freedom that we still travel. For those of you who saw the movie Lincoln, you saw the back door wheeling and dealing to pass the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. But what this movie failed to show was the work of the abolitionist movement that had been agitating for decades that forced the hand of those politicians to do the right thing once and for all. This tells us, Judge Banks, that things do not just happen. We make them happen. And in the immortal words of Frederick Douglass, Power conceives nothing, y'all, without a demand. And so on the brink of America's entry into a World War II in 1940, Cleola Crescent City, Florida native and trade unionist A. Philip Randolph, along with the NAACP and the Urban League, demanded that President Link, President Franklin Roosevelt integrate our nation's defense industries. President Roosevelt wanted to do this voluntarily, but Mr. Randolph persisted and he demanded affirmative action. After the meeting, President Roosevelt said to Mr. Randolph, quote, I agree with everything you said, now make me do it. Well, he didn't know who he was dealing with. Don't know where, who we are and where we come from. Because Mr. Randolph believed in a power, in a, that in a period of power politics, nothing counts in AACP but pressure, and still more pressure through the tactic and strategy of broad, organized, 
aggressive mass action. He went on to organize, to plan to organize more than 100,000 sleeping car porters, threatened to bring them to Washington, D.C. And when President Roosevelt saw what this bad man <clears throat> was doing, he got a quick response. And on June 25, 1941, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 8802 that created the Fair Employment Act that banned racial discrimination in the national defense industries and the federal bureaus. Friends, it shows us that things don't just happen. We, Mr. Lucy, make them happen. <laughs> president John F. Kennedy was the first president who spoke out forcibly to the American people on the issue of civil rights. After witnessing the Birmingham Children's March, a month later, he went on television on June the 11th, 1963. I'm giving you a history lesson, friends. In prime time, and famously said, quote, we are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old, Bishop Graves, as the scriptures, and it is as clear as the American Constitution. 100 years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slave, yet their heirs are not fully free. They are not yet free from the bonds of injustice. This nation will only be fully free, President and CEO Jealous until all of its citizens are free. So now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. This has been hailed as the most courageous speech of his presidency. But lest we forget, Rena, lest we forget, Daddy, that in the twilight hours of the next day, Mega Wiley Evers, your daddy, was slain, gunned down in the driveway at the age of 37. In his hands, friends, he was carrying a box of t-shirts with the words inscribed on them that Jim Crow must go. His widow and our chairman worked tirelessly for decades to get justice for her beloved husband, who said, you can kill a man, but you can't kill an idea. And so, my friends, our most important tribute to Mega Evers is our continuation of his work, unfinished till this day. <laughs> President Kennedy's fine words were not enough for us to, to end the need for their historic march on Washington for jobs and freedom that was held August the 28th, 1963. Now, all of us remember Dr. King stirring I Have a Dream message before 200,000 people that day. But let's also remember what he said to the march's organizer, Baynard Rustin, the very next day. He said, quote, you know, Baynard, I worked to get these people to the right to eat hamburgers, and now I've got to do something to help them get the money to buy them. The next civil rights struggle is economic freedom. Dr. King was always reminding us that this movement is not just about rights, but about saving our country 
from being ravaged in his words by the giant triplets of racism, of militarism, and economic injustice. Now I'm sure you don't often hear that quote on Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. NAACP, we shall not be moved. But sometimes the ground moves beneath us. That's certainly what happened in the closing weeks of the Supreme Court's most recent term. The Fisher decision fired a warning shot that they are ready to end affirmative action. The court weakened anti-discrimination laws to make it harder to bring complaints. And most outrageously, a bare majority of the justices literally gutted our precious Voting Rights Act by striking down Section 4 and threatening Section 5. The Voting Rights Act has always been our first line of defense against attacks on our right to vote. Last year was Section 5, if you remember, of the Voting Rights Act that prevented South Carolina and Texas from introducing strict voter ID laws and prevented this state, Florida, from illegally purging voters from the rolls. The Shelby decision effectively disabled the Department of Justice's ability to use Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. This decision was rendered despite the fact that Congress had just seven years ago reauthorized these critical provisions with sweeping bipartisan majorities in both houses. So it says to us that our Supreme Court is clearly out of touch, Lorraine, with current realities. And so NAACP, we must act. And our first line of action must be at the state legislatures across the length and breadth of this nation. And then we must take our fight to Washington and call on the Congress to expeditiously act in a bipartisan manner to fix the Supreme Court's shameful ruling. We need to call on the Congress to develop a comprehensive new formula, a new coverage formula that must be developed to determine which states and localities need preclearance. We have to safeguard the fundamental right to vote in this nation. And finally, in the Windsor decision, the court rendered unconstitutional at the urging of the NAACP in a broad coalition, the Defense of Marriage Act's prohibition on federal recognition of same-sex marriage. However, 37 states in our nation still do not support marriage equality and so the struggle continues. But my friends, listen. We need the coalitions that brought us to the winds of victory, as well as the coalition that is fighting for immigration reform to be with us right now in our battle for voting rights and racial and economic justice. We will not win unless we are all in this fight. Because together, we are an unstoppable force, General Holyfield. And so to those of you in this room, for other groups or from other groups, who have asked for the help of the NAACP, and we have put our history, our credibility, and our passion on the line for you. 
I ask you right now to stand with us in our hour of need. And so the question goes out tonight from Orlando, Florida. Can we count on you to be with us and to bring others to the table? And so my friends, our history is rich. Our accomplishments are many. Our goal is noble. But opponents of fairness, Ariana, resist our noble call. And while the enemies of justice engineer periods of backlash, we are determined in our hearts and we declare to the world today that when it comes to courage, John Gaston, that courage will not skip this generation. That's why we're proud of the Boston, Massachusetts branch. Under the leadership of its president and Leadership 500 alumni, Michael, attorney Michael Curry, who operates a program under a model that leadership requires an investment. And so they have launched the Boston NAACP Pipeline to Leadership Program, where young people ages 14 to 20 have an opportunity to work for the Boston branch in the summer and to address issues that are critical for issues such as health disparities, education equality, violence, and unemployment. These young people are asked to start change in their homes and their communities and their churches, and ultimately, they are changing their city. But you know, my friends, it's not enough to just post and say, we shall not be moved. Kevin, you know, we can't just post this on social media pages and tweet it out to our followers. We have to show the world how morally serious we are. Just like or in the way that Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, president of the North Carolina NAACP has demonstrated. <laughs> Reverend Barber, has led members and coalition partners to the capital of North Carolina every Monday as a powerful witness protesting the radical rightward shift of the state government that had once been a model for the New South. The Moral Monday demonstrations are the results of seven years of progressive organizing for a new Southern fusion politics per Dr. Reverend Dr. Barber. This new multicultural, multiracial coalition with an anti-racist and anti-poverty agenda is really bringing about change. And we ought to applaud Reverend Barber for his efforts and the North Carolina State Conference of Branches. These concerned citizens are not just marching, holding signs, and then going home. The power and depth of their witness is magnified by the fact that nearly a thousand people have been arrested for civil disobedience. And as many as 120 individuals in one day have been arrested. Now, they're not fighting for just a short term cause, they are building a movement from the ground up. And I believe this day that their voices will be heard in the midterm elections in 2014. But we have to do more than just applaud their work. We have to follow their example in every town, in every city, and every state in this country. Our protesting NAACP and our organizing days are not over. They are just beginning anew. For 104 years, we have been keepers of the flame. We are those who burn with a passion and a desire to ensure justice for all. And so I challenge you tonight, my friends, 
to take up the torch of freedom, take up the torch of liberty, take up the torch of justice, and go back to your neighborhoods, go back to your states, and shine a light on injustice wherever it may be found. Light a flame under elected officials who were elected to serve you. They were not entrusted with the privilege of public office just to direct resources to their friends, their large donors, or even themselves for their own economic security. James G., our movement is not for the faint of heart. Our movement, Leon, is for the strong and for the brave. And so for those of you who are not satisfied with business as usual, I want you to join me and President CEO Benjamin Jellers. I challenge you to engage your local branches, offer your leadership, lend your support, lend your creativity, and yes, lend your money to effectively work with us to secure liberty and justice for all. Because we need people who will work for freedom rather than rest on titles and position. <laughs> Derek Johnson, I know you understand that it's about the mission not the position. Leadership is not a title, it is action. And so in times like these, we must pass the torch, my friends. Don't bury the flame, because our civil rights race, it's not given to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, but to those who endure until the end. Do I have a few civil rights warriors this evening who are willing to endure until the end, who are willing to stand their ground and say with me, we shall not be moved. Say with me, we shall not be moved. Say with me, we shall not be moved. Yes, my friends, we're blessed with a rich heritage. We're blessed with a proud history. But like the mother told her son in Langston Hughes's poem, boy, <laughs> don't you turn back. And don't you sit down on those steps. The storm is raging. The enemy is advancing. The river is rising, and we can't sit down on the steps, and we can't turn back now, and we cannot be afraid, because when it comes to fighting for freedom and securing justice, courage will not skip this generation, because we shall not be moved. We've developed a five-game-changing strategy that would move us to the next level. And so we understand as the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization, it's not enough to say that we're respected, we're influential, and we're, we are the strongest voice in the fight for social justice. Because standing still and resting on our past accomplishments is not an option. And so when opponents deny us equal opportunities, we will fight for justice. When our adversaries prevent our children from receiving high quality health care and public education, we will fight for justice. When the foes restrict equal opportunity and keep us from the voting box, we will fight for freedom. We will fight for justice in this nation until the death penalty is eliminated in this country. And we will fight for justice until every American has free, 
open, equal, and protected access to the vote. But you know, freedom is not a gift. Freedom is won. And we cannot wait for freedom. We must fight for freedom and justice each and every day. And so I ask each of you to make a pledge tonight. What will you do when you leave this place? I trust that your answer will be that we will fight, Karen, for justice, and we shall not be moved. And so as I close, I leave you, my friend, The immortal words of Meg Wiley Evans, who said, and I quote, if we work with sufficient dedication, we will be able to achieve in the not so distant future a society in which no one is discriminated against on the basis of his race, his religion, or his national origin. Our faith is invested in a law that is over and above man-made law. And we are dedicated to the cause of freedom and we will continue to fight under God's law without fear of consequence. Now, in ACP, that's a tall order. But we are a great people. We've come <laughs> this far by faith. And we ain't gonna let nobody turn us around. Our faith tradition has taught us that we do not do this work alone. Because you know, Mama Dukes, there's always been someone who's been with us. Someone, Reverend Rivers, who sits high and looks low. There's always been someone who's been with us when we've been harried by day and haunted by night. There's been someone with us when we've had to stand at tiptoe stamps, never knowing quite what to expect next. There's always been someone with us when we've been plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, forever fighting a degenerative sense of nobodyness. There's always been somebody with us who's kept us in the midst of the storm. Last night, the young people said to me, that when Barack Obama became president, they felt that they can do anything and be anyone and go anywhere in the world. But last night, after the verdict came down, it made them feel as if Lady Liberty <laughs> had lost her luster and that their lives had no value. So tonight, I want to lift up our young people and ask them to come down. Youth and College Division, AXO, I want you to come down and stand with me. When you have felt and experienced what Trayvon Martin has experienced, when you're not quite sure what to do next, I want you to come down because the eyes of the nation are upon us tonight. And I want them to know these are our leaders. Not tomorrow, but these are our leaders today. And that 
standing their ground, holding their head up high. They're not on drugs. Don't have their pants hanging below their belt. They don't have multiple babies. They're in college. They're in high school. They're at the top of their class, valedictorian, all of them. Because it takes a village, Alice, it takes a village to raise our children. And so the village of the NAACP is here tonight, standing here. Young people, I want you to look at all of these adults who are standing behind you, reaching out their arms to you, saying, I got you, I see you. When you need me, I'm here for you. I'll be a mentor for you. I'll lift you up when you're discouraged. I'll help you when you fall. I'm going to be there for you. These are our children, but they represent the nation's children. They represent Trayvon Martin. They represent all of our children. And so tonight, Sammy, I'm so proud of your leadership as you lead these young leaders across this nation. I'm so proud of our youth and college division. Look at them. Look at them. Y'all can do better than that. Look at them. 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 They're ours. And we are so, 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 so very proud. We're proud of you. I want you to say with me, courage will not skip this generation. One more time. Courage will not skip this generation but what is our theme we shall not be moved thank you and god bless you all